Lake Society Magazine is Minneapolis' premier target market boutique lifestyle and design publication. It embodies the unique lifestyles and design of the Minneapolis City Lakes neighborhoods. From Lake of the Isles to Lake Harriet, it showcases the best in local design projects by both premier builders, architects, and interior designers in this area. Lake Society Magazine has the look and feel of a national publication with glossy covers, high-end finishes. It's mailed directly to upper bracket single-family homeowners in the City Lakes area. And it's the perfect local coffee table top publication. Subscriptions can also be available through the website lakesocietymagazine.com. Additionally, publisher and founder Karen Steckel has over 27 years in the local magazine publishing industry and has a passion for high-end photography and quality graphics. Her commitment to quality, visual simplicity, and beauty are strongly reflected in her beautiful Lake Society magazine. We're excited to announce that our first live event is now on sale on our website. On May 16th at 5 o'clock in the North House in Minneapolis, the Curious Builder is going to be hosting Brad Levitt, Nick Schiffer, Tyler Grace, and Morgan Molitor to a panel discussion about networking, marketing your brand and your business, and all things related to the Contractor Coalition, which is coming to Minneapolis on May 15th through May 19th. If you're looking at leveling up your business, I'd highly recommend attending. For those local here in Minnesota, it's right in your backyard. This would be an amazing time to network with some of the nation's best builders with the best building practices around. Join us for the Contractor Coalition, or if you just want to be there for one night and enjoy the networking and meet these superstars from around the country, again, that is going to be May 16th at 5 o'clock at the North House. Tickets can be bought at the ContractorCoalitionSummit.com as well as the CuriousBuilderPodcast.com. AI is uh, is going to change uh, this this product category, every product category, dramatically. Um, imagine uh, if if uh, you could um, if you could uh, inject uh, a large language model chat GTP, GPT style uh, interface into build tools and simply ask it, what was the last uh, last conversation we had about a tile selection? As these products uh, integrate email and text and all the information that is is in build tools, the purchase orders, the change orders, the selections, the documents, you could ask it any aspect of the house and have it churn through all the data and give you the, the, the correct answer in, in moments. Welcome to the Curious Builder Podcast. I'm Mark Williams, your host. Today, we're joined by Sven Gustafsson from Stonewood and Revisions. Welcome, Sven. Thank you. We had you on a few episodes ago, and we did not have enough time to continue the conversation about the one for one project as well as build tools. So I wanted to bring you back on and really kind of explore those two topics because I think you have a lot to share and it's a very interesting story. So uh, for those that haven't listened to that episode, you can check our uh, website, uh, CuriousBuilderPodcast.com, and look back uh, a few episodes and find out our introduction to Stonewood and to Sven. Uh, for those that have been there, uh, why don't we pick it up and talk a little bit about uh, the One for One project. And why don't you tell us a little bit about how you started this nonprofit and what we'll is kind of go through what it is, and how people can even get involved because it's a pretty powerful message. Sure. Um, well, I'll start with what it is and then I can tell you about where it came from. Um, so the One for One project is, uh, is, is um, a charity where for every home we build, uh, we donate one in Guatemala. Um, and we apply the same concept to the remodeling as well for a certain amount of volume. We donate a home. Guatemala. Um, the idea is to uh, is to extend the blessing of the homes that we're delivering here in Minnesota um, to to families that otherwise would never be able to afford a home. Um, it sprung from a, uh, a, a kind of a, a spur of the moment decision that I had uh, twenty some years ago to go to Guatemala uh, with my church. And uh, while I was there, I experienced building a home for family, um, and it was life changing. Uh, the The folks that we were serving. Um, we were giving them very little. Uh, the you know the homes that we're donating uh, is a, is a loose term. It's a twelve by fifteen or so uh, cinder block um, shed with a, a corrugated steel roof, a concrete floor, um, and uh, a window and a door. Um, and so it's uh, it's not anything that any any American would want to spend much time in. But for them, it's uh, it's a, a safe place. Uh, it's a place where they can raise their family and uh, and stay out of the weather and. Um, it, it's like I said, it's life changing, um, and the, the the sheer appreciation and joy and smiles of the family that we we built this first home for um, left an impression that uh, that I'll never forget. Um, and 
you know, it was it was uh, at the time such a contrast to some of the projects I had going back home uh, with clients that they, no matter how perfect the home we were building, we were falling short of their expectations and. And, uh, and even worse than that, we were just terrible people because we couldn't meet their expectations, right? And so uh, the idea came from that, that um, if if nothing else, if uh, building these uh, homes for sometimes difficult clients could result in in some good work, uh, it would make it worthwhile. Um, so that, that that's where the initial spark came from. Um, and then years later, uh, after a few more trips to Guatemala, uh, I was having conversations with some of the builders in my in my builder group. And the topic was, well, what do you do for your clients as a movement? How do you celebrate it? What do you give them? What, what sort of gift? And uh, all these kind of um, uh, simple ideas came out. The things that all of us builders probably did. Oh, we give them a bottle of wine and some flowers. And um, you know, some builders would maybe cater a meal or fill the fridge with food or you know, a tool set. Um, all these kind of silly things in hindsight. And uh, And that's where the idea came from was, Boy, our clients have everything. Uh, nothing we can give them as a gift is really that meaningful. It's a token, um, and so uh, doing something that that uh, is life changing uh, on behalf of that client by donating a home um, was something that we felt would would make a greater impact, um, and uh, and also give us an opportunity to kind of share our heart and our faith with our clients. Um, and uh, it's it's opened a lot of doors. It's it's really been uh, one of the more meaningful things that uh, that I'm able to do uh, because of my home building career. That's amazing. I love everything about what I just heard. How how often do clients know about that ahead of time? Versus it's obviously on your website, um, so you could search it out. But I mean, are people? You, how long have you been doing it? I guess I should start with. Yeah, you know, we've been doing it for uh, quite some time, um, and uh, not until the last few years did we really formalize it. And uh, honestly, it was just me personally getting comfortable with with putting it out there that this is something that we do. Um, didn't want it to feel like we were we were bragging about our good works, and and uh, you know, just trying to toe that fine line of uh, of letting people know what we're doing, um, but making sure that the reasons for it was um, was good. Um, and I think probably uh, as we partnered with uh, Highmark Builders and they started doing something similar and getting involved, um, that was kind of the spark of, okay, uh, the more we talk about this, the the more we're going to draw other builders into it, um, making sure that our clients understand what we've done for them, making it a, a bigger deal. Again, not not being brag, being boastful about it, but, but just letting them know what we've done. Um, that's drawn in clients that have made uh, donations on a yearly basis so that they're building homes. Um, and so, it, you know, we've gotten pretty comfortable with it. Uh, the, 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 the advertising component is, uh, is, is serving a really nice purpose. I think. Yeah. I love it. Do you ever have clients that um, will, would want to go on the trip itself and how often do you still go down there um, with either the team or the foundation or the church? Um, we'll talk a little bit about the mechanics yeah. and operating a nonprofit, but right now from a client facing point of view, when you're presenting it to the client, what is often their reaction, um, both for when they know about it and when they don't know about it? Um, I think most of them, uh, at this point know that it's something that we do. Um, it, it's a part of our, our culture and it's a part of our conversations with our clients and it's in our marketing. Um, and so I think they're very appreciative. It's really cool that we're able to uh, present clients with a photo of the family, a story of the family, uh, some before and after pictures of what they lived in, you know, this corrugated tin or, or uh, in some cases, kind of a corn stalk uh, uh, shack. Um, and then what they ended up with, uh, this, you know, white stucco building and smiling family in front of it. So, it, I mean, it's it's a real family. It's a real story. And it's uh, it's pretty powerful. Um, and I think, uh, you know, they they feel that it's because of their home that this happened. Um, and so it's, it's, it, it's big, um, to answer your question though, uh, I've been to Guatemala with my wife and my, and my kids now a couple of times, uh, we've been down there uh, you know, 20 plus time, times over the years. Um, we go yearly, uh, and we've brought some clients, uh, we're starting to bring some of our employees. Um, I think the desire to go is greater than our ability to take people. Um, and so there's other missionary groups, uh, usually high school kids, um, from different parts of the United States to go down and build alongside with our, our local masons in Guatemala, actually get the work done. Um, but uh, we're trying to figure out how to how to expand that and bring more of our team and build our partners down, and be a part of that because it's, it's seeing it firsthand. Um, 
makes an impact and it uh it, it keeps people engaged and uh, it makes an impact on the people that we're serving down there as well that um that there's people that care uh that uh that don't have to come do this work but they're doing it because they they uh they, they, they love them love them and uh, and and uh and want to improve their lives how did um how did Highmark come into it? Did they you knew they knew that you were doing it? Were they stumbling on it kind of independently? And Highmark is another builder here in Minneapolis for those that aren't familiar with Highmark. <clears throat> um, and then what other 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 builders and how have you sort of we mentioned you know in our previous episode how Minnesota and Minneapolis tends to be a very inclusive uh, builder state. Have you been able to kind of you know share that messaging with other builders to see if other people want to be a part of it locally? Uh, well, that's what we're doing right now, hopefully. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, we ha- we don't do a lot of marketing. Um, uh, Stonewood covers all of the overhead of the one for one project. So 100% of the donations that go uh, into the organization go to building homes. Um, and so uh, the, the marketing that we do is is the marketing that we're, we're able to fund uh, externally. Uh, Highmark got involved uh, because we met them through a builder club. Uh, uh, I think we were in Ireland maybe when we started talking about it. Um, and Jim and Terry, uh, are just amazing guys. Um, they have very similar hearts. Um, they, 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 uh, they're, they're working hard so that they can serve others. Um, and they're very generous. Um, and so that's how they got involved. Uh, a number of the builders from my builder 20 group are also involved. Um, and then, uh, just through some of the other, uh, just associations and marketing, um, we've drawn in quite a few builders around the country. The association of professional builders, uh, is a strong partner, um, as their members renew their memberships, uh, they make donations to the One for One project on a monthly basis, um, and their members uh, learn about what we're doing. And so we've drawn in a few members uh, through that organization as well. You know, last year um, I was at the International Builder Show, and I was visiting one of our sponsors, um, Adaptive, actually at the time. And then right behind them, uh, you you were there, yeah, uh, with the One for One project. And I met kind of I think it was your lead liaison. It was a lady I don't remember her name. She was up here. Betty Marita. Oh, there you go. Yep. And her, uh, her, her, uh, uh, assistant Carla. Okay. And what was, so what is her role in the one for one project? And then we'll talk a little bit about how you found, you know, that was your chance to kind of market at international billow shows. We might talk a little bit about, you know, kind of the outreach and some yeah. things that you're finding success with and some things that you're not finding success with. Yeah. Um, we couldn't do this without Betty. Um, Betty is an amazing woman who, um, who helps facilitate, uh, selecting the families and getting the houses built. Um, I mean, she really does all of the hard work in Guatemala of taking the the funding that we're able to to get to her um, and getting the work done. Um, but beyond that, uh, she does so much more. Um, she has built a training center uh, where she has um, oh, several dozen students that, uh, that do after school work there, tutoring. Um, she gets them to and from school uh, and changes lives. Um, she, she, it would take another episode to talk about all of the work she does in Guatemala, but she's, she's a pretty amazing person. She sounds like she's basically the hub of the community and helps basically facilitate the community involvement. Cause it sounds like a pretty special community that is being built down there. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we have a ton of trust in what she does. Um, you know, selecting the families that receive the homes that we're building is, uh, is a quite a process. She has a social worker on staff that will meet the hundreds of families that apply for homes and they uh, vet them. Um, they need to own the land that we're building the homes on. Uh, so they have to do some legal work to make sure that we're building on a piece of property that's not going to be taken away. Um, and then just assess the need. Um, and, you know, we can only build so many homes, about 100 a year. Um, a lot. Hey, going back to your, you mentioned your dad uh, previously, who was a builder. He had his high point hit about 100 homes. So you can actually say that you do have, you know, if you could speak. Yeah, that, I uh, suppose you, so. I, yeah, you're doing 100 homes. I like it. Different, different, different scale. Country. You've you've, you've, uh, you've branched out to other countries. You're international. Yeah, we are. Yep. And World headquarters is right here in Wayzata, Minnesota. I think I, I spent some time in Africa, you know, in my early 20s. And I remember talking to a guide. We were um, out climbing around Kilimanjaro and he was asking for some donations for his family. And through the years, just personally, I've kind of done some stuff to help his kids through school because it was important. And he had mentioned how one thing that we did, I didn't know about. And one of the benefits of traveling is understanding that like not everyone has, you know, not only the American banking system, but like mortgages. And I don't know if Guatemala has this. So I'm asking the question is like in Africa, they can only build the house in cash as they get the money. So if you have $500, you know, you can build maybe the east wall of the house. So you get another $500 next year you build. So they have to kind of, it always looks like it's incomplete, but they sort of are building in stages as they accumulate money. They didn't have the ability to go borrow money, 
have a mortgage, finance the house, and do it as most you know people in the United States would probably be in some form of housing. At least if you're listening to this, you likely are. Um, is Guatemala in a similar state in terms of like how a home is funded? Is that why not only obviously we'll speak to why a home is so fundamental, but the process of actually doing it is that similar? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know if mortgages exist in Guatemala. I, I suspect they do, but certainly not for the, the people that we're serving. Uh, these, these homes cost $2,500 each to build, uh, labor and materials. Um, very often we'll go into a project and there will be a, a, a pile of cinder blocks. Um, that they're buying one or two at a time as they can afford them uh, with the plan of building home at some point. Um, and so that's that's a pretty common process. You drive around uh, Guatemala City and Sapongo, the, the community that we work in, and Many, many homes, uh, especially the larger ones, will have rebar and concrete sticking out the roof for the next level. Um, they're planning for when they can afford to add the second story. Um, different situation with the, the folks we're serving. You know, they're like I said, they're they're saving up uh, by investing in the building materials as they go and accumulating them. How have you? Uh, I mean, you obviously made it extremely personal. Um, what did what you brought your children down there? What do your What do your kids say about it? I have to imagine it. Being that you were a young man when you went down there and the impact it had on you and what you've done with it, a lot of people have had impactful things, but not many people have had something happen like that and then act on it in the way that you did. I guess I'm sure, I'm guessing you didn't have this all premeditated ahead of time, but what messages do you share with your kids now and how do they react to what they see? You know, I, I hope it made an impact. It's hard to know, um, but just seeing uh, how how uh, folks in third world countries live. You can see it on TV um, and you can see pictures and you can be told stories, but until you see it firsthand, um, I don't think it quite makes uh, the this, this same impact. Um, and so I hope my kids remember that. Um, they see kids that are, are you know, playing in, in you know, a, a, a cornstalk home, um, you know, not wearing shoes uh, and in spending the day with us without school. Um, and just how little they have, but how joyful they are. Um, that that's the impact that it, I think that it's hard for anybody to see that and uh, and not be impacted. Um, yeah. and, and everyone that we've taken on these trips uh, has stayed involved. Uh, we do a yearly fundraiser, and they're the first to to get, to get up and call for donations and tell the stories and and get uh, get pretty loud about uh, their excitement about hey, you got to do this because it's really important and it's life changing and get out your checkbooks and it's, you know, they're, they're passionate about it. That That's, you had mentioned it was through your uh, local church here that you first, they had a relationship with that. Why, why Guatemala? Why that specific place? Um, you know, I don't know, uh, why Guatemala was chosen for that particular, uh, trip. Um, you know, my story was I'd, I'd just broken up a relationship and was at church and it was last call to go to go to Guatemala, and I had nothing going, so I was like, "All right, I'm in," because uh, I, I my, my my schedule just opened up. Um, and uh, on that trip, I met my my now wife, um, okay. and uh, and a lot of my best friends, and so it was it was life changing in in a lot of ways. Wow, yeah, there's no joke that that there's some divine intervention there by the sounds of it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, being. You know, someone that also uh, tries to be a, a Christian as well. I, I think even in thinking about this, I was just thinking about the parallel of a home and what it can be for a family and having a dad and trying to relate to some of these things. But, you know, a Christian principle, I mean, Jesus healed a lot of people, um, but, you know, so that he could, that was a miracle naturally, but the real miracle is what you could do after. In that sort of vein and thought, you know, having a Christian organization help facilitate a place where someone who is hungry and homeless and needs a place to live, how has that helped facilitate either the gospel message or there's obviously a natural part here. I'm not discounting that at all because uh, it's very needed and important. But you know, what have you seen in their lives, even from maybe a spiritual standpoint? Because I have to imagine that that's part of the messaging as well. Absolutely. Um, you know, and it's it's not something that we we necessarily broadcast. Um, well, it's a, it's a, it's on our website. We're not hiding behind anything. Um, it's a Christian organization. We're doing it um, uh, because it's what we're called to do: serve others, um, and because of our faith. Um, but the the house is really the the first step. It's kind of a a foot in the door with these families. Um, we require that uh, the family works with us while we're building the house. We require that they they've got some financial skin in the game, uh, so they they have a certain amount of money that they have to put into it as well. 
Um, and so being able to spend the week building a house with the family, um, we have social workers, we have a pastor that is a part of that process that's on site meeting these families and getting to know them um, and building a relationship. Um, hopefully getting their children involved in the tutoring programs and the training center work that they do. Um, and, uh, and, and being able to have that, that those conversations about faith, um, which is the most important part of what we're doing. Um, and one of the other things that, uh, that Betty's organization does is once the house is built, uh, she'll offer them, uh, bunk beds, um, so that the, the house can really double in size when you've got beds stacked, right? And in order to get that, you have to go through a series of, uh, of educational series on alcoholism, on sexual abuse, um, and on hygiene. And once the parents go through that, then they, they get this bunk bed donated like to them. She's a very special person. She's, uh, she's unique. Yeah, she's amazing. I mean, this education piece, I mean, I, we take for granted, or I do, you know, the amount of educational benefits that you have. And, you know, I have three young kids. Mine are a little younger than yours on our last episode. You had mentioned that. I think it was, what, 17, 10, and 8, somewhere around there? Uh, 13, 10, and 8. Yep. 13, 10, and 8. And I'm 7, 5, and 3. So I'm about five, six years behind you in that. But, you know, as a parent, you sometimes don't realize how much teaching you do by your daily actions. And I always say that kids can sniff out hypocrisy faster than anything on the planet. And uh, I mean, they really see if something is honest or true or dishonest. And so as you're, as a dad trying to teach this stuff, um, it becomes very apparent that what you're teaching them, they're going to see the truth of it. So be honest about it. And where I'm going with this is that, you know, as you are building this home with these people, uh, the humanity of it is, is a beautiful thing. Like, I love the idea that you're working with these people. They're working with you, you know, the, um, you know, the pastor and the, and the, the ministries, they're like, it's, everyone is there together. I'd imagine an open format. And I would assume that it's, you know, not sort of a pay to play. Like, you know, if you come to the church for this long, then you get a house. I assume it's probably more open than that, but you can speak more to that. Yeah. It's really based on need and, uh, and, and kind of first come first serve, you know, if they meet the criteria, uh, there's a long list. And, uh, as we build homes and communities, a list grows. Oh, you, you Houses are being donated. Uh, I mean, 100 homes a year is no joke. Son. I mean, that's a lot of homes. Yeah, that's the capacity. Uh, I don't know that we've hit that uh, quite yet, but uh, that that's our capacity. And it will certainly hit it this year with uh, we're, we're having a good year. Should those that want to help is the, I mean, obviously funding has to happen. You had mentioned that, you know, your ability for those that even want to go there is maybe somewhat limited. You know, what are, I think a lot of times people, I'll speak for myself, a lot of times I don't, you know, I, you read the paper, you stay informed, but you sometimes don't know I've elected to do some stuff locally that I can be directly impacted on. I, I think everyone's called to it differently. There's no right or wrong, but I, I feel like a lot of people want to do something, but they don't know a, how to do it. They don't know where to do it. And, and, and what you're doing with the one for one project is giving them a place that they can kind of fulfill some of those needs that they didn't, that they don't know how to fulfill. How with that kind of wrapping of a question, how is sure. it that people can most help the one for one project? You know, honestly, it's financial and just spreading the word. Um, you know, Twenty five hundred dollars builds a home, and uh, it, it, you can see the the actual family that was served as those homes are built. Um, but you know, we're we're working on, uh, on on growing the organization so that uh, that more and more folks can can actually visit and, uh, and, and put boots on the ground and be a part of that process. Um, it's kind of funny. Uh, when we go down to help build a home, we slow the process down. Uh, it, it's, it's the funny story that every time we take a new family down there, they'll see that we'll work all morning and we'll get uh, two or three uh, levels of block laid on the house. And uh, then the Americans will go take lunch. The Masons keep working and we come back and there's seven new layers. <laughs> In that 15 minutes, we disappeared and got out of their way. Um, and so it took some getting used to, to, you know, what are we doing here? We're just slowing this process down. Why don't we just save the money and the plane tickets and the, the hotel and just send the money. Um, but it, it's the relationships that it mean as much as the home. Um, and so, you know, it's, a, it's an important component of what we're doing. Um, but going back to, to Betty and some of your questions earlier, her organization is called Breaking Cycles. Um, and the, the, the meaning behind that is truly breaking the cycle of poverty in these families that uh, getting the kids to school, uh, helping them to do something other than working in the coffee fields or working in the market, um, really going through the same process that Betty went through, um, where 
her, she made the decision to go to school and her mother made the decision to, to, to send her to school rather than to continue in what was the family business of selling chicken in the market. Um, that's what she's trying to do to educate people that, um, the next generation doesn't have to do this. And, and, uh, through the donations of, of the one for one project in the Cherry Avenue, uh, organization, being able to pay for the schooling for these kids so that it, it can help offset, um, the, the income that the families would otherwise have if their kids went and worked in the coffee fields or the cornfields. Is, is there a lot of local support? I mean, how are, how is the one for one project received down there? Obviously for those that are a part of it, of course, they would feel, I would imagine gratitude. That's amazing. But in the surrounding community, what is the relationship, you know, with the community and with one for one? Um, oh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's huge. I think, uh, Betty is very much appreciated in her community. Um, she is, uh, a, a, a leader, um, and at least the, the folks that live in the community, uh, see her as a huge blessing. Um, Guatemala has a terribly corrupt government, um, uh, yeah. um, <laughs> it, it, uh, redundant statement there, corrupt government. Um, but there is a more corrupt than most. Um, and so navigating that is, uh, is a constant complexity of what she does down there. Um, Do you guys have to get involved with that at all or how, how does, you know, we'll talk a little bit about, I'm always been fascinated personally about how you run a nonprofit, how it works. And we'll talk about maybe the business mechanics of that in a second. But I mean, piggybacking that with the government, you know, getting funds to and through to Betty, has that been a challenge or a learning curve for you? Yeah, I think we've we've got that figured out at least for now until something else changes. But it's been difficult over the years. Um, it, it you know Guatemala is one of the most corrupt and violent places in the world, um, and so uh, just having funds sit in Guatemala uh, and and Betty being in charge of those funds is is not safe. Um, so we've had to deal with some things to just make sure that we're doing it in a, a way that's going to. Uh, protect her and protect the funding and, and keep things uh, from from being uh, skimmed by different folks. Right. Wow. Interesting. I, it sounds like you could talk to uh, a number of other agencies around the world as they distribute their funds in a way that that doesn't get taken advantage of. Uh, what At what point, because it's not a political talk show, uh, at what point... Um, at what point did you learn that you needed to just kind of put some of those safeguards in kind of the early days or how did it, was there any difficult experiences that like, whoa, this is going to change how we do things? Yeah. You know, I think always, um, just wiring funds to Guatemala, um, it would, uh, would take weeks, uh, you know, an instant transfer and the funds don't become available for a while. So just little things like that, just big navigating international banking, um, and, and figuring out how to get her money without it being too problematic. Um, you know, setting up the nonprofit in the United States so that the donations we were taking in um, had another benefit for the folks that were actually donating so that it was tax deductible, um, all the normal things. Um, the, this last couple of years, um, the government uh, decided that they didn't like nonprofits operating in uh, in Guatemala. And so they, they changed the rules uh, behind the scenes, didn't really tell anybody. And uh, and they decided that if you didn't uh, refile your organizational papers and declare all of your assets in Guatemala, that your nonprofit would be deemed uh, null and void and all the assets would go to the government. Um, many, many nonprofits in Guatemala folded because of that. Um, we had a, uh, a builder in Michigan that donated a uh, the funding for a new school bus. Um, and this is kind of a, a pretty cool story. This is God working in the background through this uh, through this just happenstance donation. Um, donated the school bus, and uh, in order to own a commercial vehicle in Guatemala, you had to have a different kind of an organization. And so Betty went to to set that organization up so that she could purchase a school bus and all that. Found out that these laws had changed. She had days to to make these registrations and things, and uh, and narrowly avoided having all of her assets seized by the government. Um, so, you know, I think that was God working in the background. It wasn't just the school bus. It was, it was what saved her little organization, but, um, you know, corrupt government, uh, there's always some little thing that's, they're working to trip her up. And there's so many stories, uh, that I could tell that are, are along those same lines where she's just trying to keep her head above water to, to do the good work she's doing. I mean, the sharing of stories is obviously such a powerful, uh, tool to educate people. Um, how often do you know, especially your clients that you're giving this amazing gift to. And for those that would volunteer their time or their donations, how do you communicate that messaging back to them 
you know, from Guatemala? Are they doing testimonials? And you mentioned the photo in the house, but how do you kind of stay <clears throat> in touch, you know, if you will, with kind of what's happening? Yeah, you know, we do some email marketing. Uh, we have a fundraiser every year where Betty comes from Guatemala and uh, gives us an update. Um, yeah, I think there's nothing better than hearing from from her what's going on and what she, you know, telling stories of, of different uh, students that that uh, are being sponsored, uh, telling stories of of the folks that are uh, receiving the homes. Um, we post before and after pictures of every home we build on the website, the one for one org. Um, so I, you know, those are the primary uh, ways that we're communicating with folks. Where do you see? Do you, see, do you have uh, a lot of networking opportunities or collaboration with other entities that are doing similar work? Or how has that opened up your eyes to, um, you know, basically other organizations that are doing similar things? Uh, we're, we're all about collaboration. Um, it's just for lack of time that uh, that we haven't done more with it yet. Um, we're still a pretty young organization, I think, as a nonprofit in the U.S. Um, and uh, my my full time job is building houses, so um, always looking for volunteers, always looking for partnership opportunities. Um, and we've 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 come across some some fantastic people that have come alongside us, and um, mostly just through funding um, and uh, and basically mirroring what we're doing at Stonewood and Revision with donating homes. Well, it's a, it's a wonderful story. Thanks for sharing. We'll have everything in the show notes as well, and. You know, we'll do some additional posts specifically uh, about one for one uh, when this episode comes out. Um, where can uh, listeners find um, the specific portal, or is it just one for one project dot com? The one for one dot yeah. org. Okay. Um, confusing name. Everyone thinks it's the one forty one project. Uh, the one for one one house for one house. Yeah, I think the naming actually is, is quite genius. You have a knack for naming. Uh, Thank you. Your piece of sort about Stonewood and revisions. Uh, one for one is a very uh, clever uh, play on words. So, um, well, amazing work. Um, we've had, you know, on a previous episode, we had Mark Ostrom on uh, from the Joy Collaborative. I don't know if you've ever met him. If not, I should put you guys in touch. Um, he does stuff here locally for um, uh, kids in need. And so uh, we're going to be doing some fundraising stuff for him later this year. So, you know, I could talk offline about, you know, what we can do or what the Curious Builder can do in terms of broadcasting and messaging, other than obviously sharing it as we are now, but um, I think as we're doing networking groups and we're having builders on, you know, I think it's a, uh, I think there'd be a lot of alignment and hopefully people listening will reach out to you after this episode and you know, we can kind of move the needle. Yeah, please do. This episode is brought to you by Adaptive, the software for builders that automates draws, budgets, and bookkeeping with AI. For over a year now, I've been partnered with Adaptive and they've just been an amazing game changer in terms of efficiency in our time and all our bookkeeping. When, from the time we get an invoice, we import it into their system. The AI codes it, cost codes it, job codes it. All we have to do is review it, pass it through the people internally in the office, all digitally, and then it gets approved and paid all via ACH. It's becoming extremely fast and saving us countless hours a day and a week. When it comes to draws, all of our budgets now are set in adaptive as well. So now when we cost code against the draws, we can do our change orders. And then with a click of a button, we can submit these draws to our title companies or to our homeowners for faster payment. If you're looking to save time, and if you're looking to be accurate, I highly recommend Adaptive. Additionally, if you'd like to listen to one of their founders share the story of Adaptive, you can listen to episode number 15 on the Curious Builder podcast. This episode is brought to you by Pella Northland. For 19 and a half years, I've been building homes and 95% of all of my homes have used Pella windows. I couldn't be happier to call them a partner in our builds and our remodels. Whether you're an architect, a designer or a remodeler, I'd highly recommend Pella windows. They can fit old homes, new homes, reclaimed, commercial, and really everything in between. Pella is a company that we trust and that we recommend to our clients. Additionally, in management, Peter and Ed have just been absolute fantastic people to work with, as well as mentors to me personally. So when it comes time to look for a window, I'd highly recommend Pella windows. Find more at PellaNorthland.com. Also, if you're interested, you can hear episode one where I interview Peter and Ed together for a great listen on business and Pella Windows. And kind of moving on to a second part here, one of the things that we had mentioned uh, in our previous interview uh, was you had mentioned that you went to college um, as a software developer, or that was your first job out of college. Is that right? Uh, yep. Didn't go to college. I, I was a poli sci major. Um, it, it just, you, just Maybe this is a talk show for politics. Could be. Oh. Yeah. Don't get me going. Uh, it's an election year, right? Um no, uh, I, uh, poli sci, I, I don't know what you do with that if you're not a politician or attorney. Uh, I, I decided to go into software development. Um, 
And uh, I did that for a few years post-college uh, and before getting involved in the family business. Um, and as I mentioned, I, I uh, intentionally got out of that before I got too comfortable because um, I, I knew early on that I wanted to be a home builder. Um, I think I ended up in poli-sci because I didn't see anything else that other than some econ classes uh, that really entrepreneurship that really applied to building houses. Um, there's no house building school. Um, so I developed software for a while because it was an opportunity um, to, to learn and a uh, um, you know, great opportunity for a first job out of college. Uh, but but quit that and uh, joined up with my family um, and uh, tried to add value wherever I could as I as I truly learned the business, um, you know, hopefully getting paid to build houses rather than just working with a family grown up. Yeah, how when you know during your evolution of you know obviously being hired by working with your mom and dad, learning the ropes, you know, um, building a ho- building homes, kind of at what point you mentioned how your dad had a checkbook for different accounts. And so this was obviously before computers were, you know, used uh, regularly. You mentioned that you bought the first computer for the company. No, I'd say computers were being used regularly, just not by the construction <laughs> company when I got involved. I said, uh, this wasn't prehistoric times. No. Uh, my, I guess my point in saying that was, at what point did you realize that there was an opportunity to use your skills as a software developer and start developing what became build tools which is, you know, a software for builders by builders. Walk us through that evolution when you had the idea and kind of how it maturated. Yeah. Um, you know, it evolved kind of from an Excel spreadsheet. I, I developed all of the systems within our small construction company to manage monthly payment requests and you name it, everything we're doing, scheduling. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as uh, the internet became more and more prevalent, um, we we found a couple of online tools that we started using to to manage a lot of our practices. We we started using a uh, a, a product called Build Links. Um, it had a lot of promise. It looked a bit like Builder Trend and 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 what what is now Build Tools. Um, and we used that for probably a year to the point where our employees uh, almost mutinied and said, "You know what? This makes our job harder." Um, and it it. Like I said, it had a lot of promise, but it wasn't built for a cost plus open book custom home builder. It was built for a model option builder. And we were able to kind of wrangle our our team around it and make it work. Um, but it, it didn't deliver on the promise of, of really creating an efficiency. And so we, we pulled the plug on that and uh, it we built a couple of very rudimentary tools to manage change orders and manage our budgets um, and, uh, and then grew it from there. Um, I hired a software developer to build a, uh, a change order management system online because that was our pain point at the time. And uh, he did a really nice job, super fun. And uh, I, you know, I got giddy about it. All right, now let's do this next thing. And then we built a budget and then we built, uh, I don't know, document management. And, and we just kind of grew uh, this tool um, module by module. Um, but what we did differently than uh, say Builder Trend um, is we we built it all based on the budget. So we had this core that everything tied back to and it all kind of, it made sense. Uh, it had a budget that that was the core of it. The change orders tied back to a budget code, the purchase orders tied back to a budget code, the selections tied back to a budget code. Um, and it, it uh, while it was, it was grown module by module, um, it had a rhythm to it. And it, it uh, even though it was very complex, uh, the data was all shared between the modules in a very smart way, um, as opposed to some of the other tools that were out there. Um, and we just used it internally. Uh, and then going back to our last conversation about the the Builder Twenty Group, uh, I wouldn't shut up about this tool that we built. And uh, you know, my my conversation in our meetings was less about building homes and more about this software that I built. And uh, they started using it. Um, and then we ran a couple of Google ads and uh, and you know, let's see if anyone's willing to pay for this thing. And it it took off. Was that so? What year was this that this kind of all was happening? Oh boy, I, I, yeah, I lose track. It was probably, uh, it's probably 15 years ago, 12, 15 years ago. Yep. And at the time that you, so it was, you obviously built it out of necessity in your own need and having your own skill set and then just kind of adding it on. Did you have an idea that you knew what it was going to become or you were just simply solving a need and it sort of happened? It, it kind of was growing. I mean, you knew about it, but you understand what I'm saying. Like, it, it kind of grew out of necessity, and then it became something like, "Oh, well, we've got something." It grew out of necessity because there wasn't a product that did things in the way that we wanted to do them. Um, 
you know, we could use a product like Builder Trend and we could use the parts that worked and not use the parts that didn't work and it kind of muddle through the things that didn't make sense. Um, but so much of those products didn't make sense. They, they were built by software engineers. Um, they weren't built by people that were actively building homes. Um, and I think some of them even kind of beat their chest and said, oh, we're, we're smart software guys. And I was building a house and the process was so confusing that I decided to, to build a tool to fix my builder. Um, but they don't know anything about building houses. So um, what people continually said about build tools was, oh, this, this works just like we do. And that, that the nomenclature, the terminology is uh, that we, we call them a change order, not a, a modification agreement. Or like, I mean, this is rudimentary things like that, that these, these guys just didn't get. Um, Procore, same thing. Um, you know, it was built by somebody that went through the process and thought it could be done better. And so, as a software guy, I built built this uh, tool. Um, but most builders look at it and like, I can see how I could make it work, but it doesn't totally make sense. The other thing is, well, I'll get back to that question in a minute. So, as you are unveiling this to your Builder Twenty group, and then you're testing the market, were you only at that time selling it out of state? I remember hearing about it. Um, I had sampled Builder Trend a little bit, and I was a little, we were only at the time doing a handful of homes, and um, I, I kind of had a revolt from the people that I was trying to introduce it to. They're like, we don't want anything to do with this; it's not ready for us. And uh, then maybe it was a couple of years later. Um, I, I think it was actually Jared um, Jared Johnson. So he had worked for me for a short period of time. We went to high school together, but you guys had a childhood friendship as well. And uh, he actually left working. He was a project manager for us for just a few months. Left and worked for you. Went to you know create and kind of run build tools. Yeah, he was the anti Sven. He went from construction to being a software product manager. <laughs> Shout out to Jared. Yeah. Um, anyway, at what point did you start selling it in state? Was there ever a point where you were not selling it to your local competitors? You were only selling it out state? Yeah, not? it kind of happened organically. I mean, honestly, uh, I felt like it was such a big part of who we were that I didn't want to share it with any of our competitors. Um, it was so unique. It was a different maker. It was a sales maker. It was. I mean, I can see how that would be a huge um, advantage. We had builders in uh, in you know Texas markets that uh, said, "Hey, well, we're in. We want to sign up for this, but can we pay more so you won't sell it to anybody else in our market?" Um, so they saw the same thing that we saw that. Boy, this is something that um, is creating such an efficiency, uh, and it's such a, a differentiator that we we want this to be our secret sauce. Um, Did you do that? Did you sell it to them at a higher rate so that you kind of have? Oh, I think there were a couple where we probably said, "Yeah, sure, yeah, we, we won't sell it to anybody else." Sure. Or not really marketing either, so it was an easy sell. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think in in the Minnesota market, it happened a little organically. We just we grew to a point where. You know what? If if one of our competitors wants to use it, great. Um, you know, I'll. There, there's a lot of options out there. It's not as unique as it was ten years earlier. Um, and if one of my competitors wants to pay me for my software, boy, I think I can use that as in my sales pitch that our competitors are using our software to run their uh, their construction companies, which is still the case. Um, in a, in a lot of cases, um, we know a thing or two about running the the, the back end or the front end of uh, managing all this information and and. Uh, know a thing or two about the, the processes of building a home so much so that our competitors use our software. Um, okay. You know, we, we just kind of got comfortable with that position. Right. I imagine that at some points people would ask you or feel uncomfortable, like, well, man, you built the software, you know, everything like I'm putting all my financial details in here. Yeah. And not so much from your point of view, because you would be kind of the king of the castle, but for those that would maybe be signing up for it thinking like, oh man, we're going to compete against Stonewood on a job. That's your parent company. Uh, Man, Sven's going to know everything that we've got in. Did you ever face those questions? Yeah, I had a few conversations about that. Look, I'm not going to look under the hood and, and look at your data. Um, if you're worried about that, uh, you use a different product. Um, but you know, I I I'm, I'm a home builder and I've got this software company and I have people that are running it. Um, so you just you just have to trust us that we're not going to do that. And we spent a lot of time um, making sure that the data was segregated as well. That was one of my big fears. Is just like the builders that are maybe going to use our tool, um, I don't want my data to accidentally end up in someone else's, in someone else's system. And so we we spent a lot of time just engineering it so that it was all very siloed and and safe. How did you have the time to, you know, build build tools? I you know you hired out a portion of it. Um, th at what point did you assemble a team and kind of oversee it? Walk us through the kind of the creation of this. I, you hear a lot about, you know, people want to make an app, but they, it sounds really cool and sexy and whatnot. There's a lot of work that goes into it and a ton of stuff that doesn't work that you figure out. Yeah. As I assume the last thing you want to do is unveil something 
and then tick off a bunch of people, which inevitably does sort of happen. It just is kind of the nature of the beast, I would imagine. But how did you manage the team while you're also building, you know, high-end custom homes and remodeling as well and yeah, growing a family? Yeah, you know, we, we were our own little laboratory, right? I mean, our, our software engineers were all offshore. We had a Belgian living in Costa Rica that was the core of our uh, of our development team. Really smart guy. Um, he could see 10 steps down the road. And as I was designing things, he was telling me the problems that were going to happen if he, if we did it my way. Uh, and so he'd fix it. Um, you know, a lot like, a lot like the one for one project in Betty Marita, uh, it couldn't happen without these really smart people that, that were doing the the heavy lifting. Um, and you know, that in conjunction with our office being a, a laboratory for this, when we wanted to figure out how to build a module that issued purchase orders, all right, let's go talk to our purchasing guy uh, and, and understand how his job works and where are the inefficiencies and how, how can we make this better? Um, you know, at the time, uh, that was an inspirational moment on purchase orders when I watched my purchasing manager print a PO out of our out of our accounting software. And then uh, he went and scanned it because there wasn't a PDF maker, I think, or something at the time. Uh, then, then he emailed it off to somebody or he faxed it and then filed the... I mean, it was a very tedious... It was a 15 minute process to send a purchase order. Um, and we, we figured out, oh, we can do this with a couple of clicks. Um, so it was all those little, uh, just watching how the process is not working and and then let the software engineers fix it. When I was introduced to it, and I can't remember what year it would have been, let's call it 2012, 13, 14, somewhere in there, I'm guessing. I My first reaction to seeing the software display, kind of seeing it happen was how clean the interface was. And it reminded me of kind of Apple products. You know, they talked about how much design and time goes into, you know, the intuitive nature of Apple. And, you know, so shout out to your entire team for creating something like that. I remember graphically, I, I really like strong branding and imagery, but also clean and simple. And I felt like your product not only had it, but now it makes more sense of why it was so intuitive. You know, a builder and having a software background built it together. It wasn't one or the other. It was kind of yin and yang working together to get it because I'll tell you what, it was one, it was a very smooth sailing machine. And like anything, there's things that it was evolving and there was things that still needed to do. You know, sometimes looking back, I'm sure you're like, wow, can't believe that we did do this, that, and other thing. Oh, for sure. We're looking at it through the lens of, you know, it's 15 years since it started, right? So, so much has changed. Uh, yeah. The look and feel was always important to me. Um, you know, it's, it's a piece of software that in my organization still today, uh, my employees use it's between that and their email, it's the only two applications they use. So uh, we, we have employees that are, are staring at this, you know, seven hours a day um, and doing their whole job through that that tool. And so making it easy to use with the fewest number of clicks and you know, just it, making it make sense was important, um, and, but making it pretty was important as well. I mean, if, if people don't enjoy the experience and it's not clean, they, they will find reasons not to use it. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of proof behind that. The, uh, you know, w one of the, the major challenges in building this thing, once we started um, opening it up to outside builders, was we're, we're a small, nimble, growing software company and uh, we can do anything we want. Um, and so filtering out what we should do and what we could do, uh, it, so many builders across the country do things in just bizarre ways. And so, um, fighting the urge to add features that made no sense, um, just because it would make a sale and it would, it would make that builder happy, uh, but it would bloat this product into some Franken software. Like, that, give, me, like give me an example. That sounds too juicy of a, of a one. To boy, I don't know. I mean, just the way, uh, it, uh, it's, it's hard to describe, but, um, a lot of things have evolved around fees and, uh, and hiding fees and marking things up and, and being able to decipher how they were hiding money in one line item, but not showing it to the client, and you know, honestly, kind of creating some. Was that, was that the Madoff Building Group out of New York? Honestly, I, it's a William something out of oh, Minnesota. Oh yeah. uh, no, <laughs> um, no, uh, no. There were just all sorts of goofy things like that, where um, I get very much like the building business. Boy, I can make this sale if I do this thing, um, but it's not the right thing to do, so we're not going to do it. Um, and who made those? I mean, did you as a collective group, but you got, you, you, you got all these emails or all these, you know, they're coming up on your dashboard. You have, let's say a Monday meeting or whenever you met and you would see all these things up on the board. And as a team, you'd kind of vote for them or were you kind of at that point, you were, you know, essentially the head and you'd be like, no, 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 no. And just kind of deciding right then and there, how did you do the review process of what made sense and what, what was part of the core vision versus what was it versus maybe 
It could be, but we don't know what to do with it. It was just ongoing conversations because it was always, we were always tweaking features and adding things that made sense. Um, you know, again, back to the fees, you know, but trying to accommodate a fixed bid builder and a cost plus builder um, all in one one system where, you know, one builder is showing his fee as a line item, the other is mixing his percentage into every line item. One is is just showing in the bottom line, but wants to be able to track everything and not disclose it all. And so it, it, it was, uh, it's a pretty complex piece of software with uh, a lot of permissions and little switches you can flip to do things in a different way. Um, and then we start working in markets that have sales tax, um, that the builder has to add sales tax as a line item in their budget. Uh, and then Canadians with the crazy taxes they have in VAT. And um, we at one point we had uh, we had Italians and Australians and French builders all using the system. So now we're adding languages. Um, oh, wow. So it, it it got pretty complex and just, you know, it was an ongoing process of, okay, are we going to translate this to Thai? Um, I don't think so uh, for the one builder. How, uh, so, you know, the secret's out, you, you sold the company. Uh, walk us a little bit through um, that evolution, how you approached, how you decided it, and mainly just as there's those listening that they are curious about business. But there's a lot of people, there's a lot of interest, especially with, you know, the landscape we'll talk about after this, you know, AI coming in or here and just where this evolves. I think a lot of people want to develop things and figure out like, how do I do a side business that also complements my main business? So walk us through the evolution of the sale of your company and when you knew it was the right time and we'll kind of go from there. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it was the, the time was uh, determined just by the opportunity. Um, we had uh, rebuilt the product from the ground up, fixed a lot of the the, the uh, bugs under the hood. Um, that was 2.0, right? That was 2.0. Um, and the, the 1.0 version was was truly a Franken product. Uh, we bolted so many different things together with open source this and open source that. Um, and when we showed it to the crew that was going to redevelop it into the 2.0 version, uh, I, I distinctly remember them saying, this actually works. Uh, like they were horrified. Uh, probably 80% of the code was just dead code that just hadn't been removed. It was it was ugly. Um, so, you know, we spent a couple of years rebuilding the product into something that we were proud of that that uh, operated really well in massaging the features and, and uh, and, and and making it work more quickly. Um, and in hindsight, that was the easy part. Um, marketing a software product and uh, and building the user base and the amount of money and effort that goes into uh, to, to maintaining um, the, the clients and avoiding churn clients that are bouncing from one product to another. Uh, it's truly the hard part. And um, so, you know, the opportunity to sell it to a group that uh, is a 2,500 person in a company with marketing departments and marketing channels, um, I think was the right thing for the product. Uh, we were at a point where we'd be spending millions of dollars uh, just to get word out that we have a better mousetrap. And uh, it, 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 it that would have become my full-time job. So it was really a choice between continuing to build houses or, or being a, an operator of a software company. And Raising, raising venture capital and, and going down that path. That opportunity, they came to you. How did, how did that opportunity present itself? Yeah, um, we had a couple of a couple of groups come to us simultaneously uh, with interest. Um, uh, ECI is a, a company that um, focuses in a lot of different areas, but they've got a, a, a pretty robust construction practice. And before their acquisition of Build Tools, um, they didn't have a product that would have appealed to builders like you and I. Uh, they were very, I think they've got a large part of the market share if you're a production home builder um, and they have software at lumber yards that's talking to their production, uh, you know, their production builder software. Um, so this kind of rounded out their software offering. Um, so it, it was a good fit for them. And they're based out of Texas, is that right? They are. Okay. Great company, great people. Um, you know, they we, we share a, a similar heart. They do some very uh, great stuff um, charitably um, and they've just been, they've been wonderful people. If you, how many years has that been now? Oh, I lost track three or four years, I think, ago, uh, sold them that business. Now, obviously, you're still a user of, of Build Tools. How is it still under the name Build Tools? It is, yep. yep. Um, they they have uh, a little more inclusive branding, so it's a Build Tool. I think it's ECI Build Tools. or yeah. um, So it's changed its look a little bit. How, like anything that you've grown, you, know, you had it for 10 years or 13 years or 15 years, however long it was, what's it like now having sold it to the right opportunity 
I mean, like anything, it's kind of like you see it kind of graduate and go to college and there's got to be some regrets about, you know, this, that, and another thing, or does it kind of have you energized maybe to do something different? Because so much, think of how much the landscape has changed in the last four years, uh, especially with, you know, AI. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it was, it was an exciting time. Um, it was a baby, uh, you know, it was, it was super fun and, uh, I really enjoyed building the software, but, uh, as I told you earlier, having lived in 30 some homes over the years and moving every six months, uh, I don't get too attached to, to things. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think it's in good hands and, uh, it, it, um, is it's a very competitive product. I think it's better built and the, the feature set is, is still far superior to anything that, that's out there. Um, but your comments about AI, I think that's going to change the landscape significantly. Um, one of the things that uh, the builder trend has working against it or co-construct has working against it is just the, the number of users and the legacy of the the, the people that are, are using it. Trying to make a, a small change to that, just moving moving an icon or a button confuses you know, 2,000 companies. Um, and so... Uh, I think once you have a platform with a, a large user base, it's it, that's a liability more than it's an asset uh, in terms of evolving to the next thing. Um, AI is uh, is going to change uh, this this product category, every product category, dramatically. Um, imagine uh, if if uh, you could um, if you could uh, inject uh, a large language model, Chat GTP, GPT style uh, interface into build tools and simply ask it. What was the last uh, last conversation we had about a tile selection, um, or what you know? What how, how much are we? You know, you could have it do math equations just on the budget. Um, you know, how much uh, as 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 these products uh, integrate email and text and all the information that is is in build tools, the purchase orders, the change orders, the selections, the documents. You could ask it any aspect of the house and have it churn through all the data and give you the 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 correct answer in in moments. Um, so I think that's something that's going to change that product. That's an interesting frame set. I'm just thinking about, you know, you have, you know, your photos, you have your documents, you have your bids, you have your POs, you have your, uh, you know, the plans, the plan updates, the design input, the client approved change orders. I'm thinking just all the questions you could ask. I mean, obviously you have the budgets, but you can say, how much do I need to cha charge on this change order? You know, or what, you know, just simple stuff that the software is already telling you that. I'm sure you have better examples than that, but I'm just thinking of like, you know, what, what are the next three change orders most likely going to be? Predictive. Yeah. Or, you know, like, yeah, I think so. It, um, you could have it be, be predictive. You can have it churn through past budgets. I mean, hypothetically, right. Uh, you know, boy, the, we've got a three story house of 6,800 feet. That's in this style. Um, it can, what it can do with that historical data is going to be pretty interesting and it can, it can weight the, the more current projects heavier than the older projects. Um, it's going to be able to do some pretty cool stuff. Uh, we record um, all of our design meetings and all of our budget conversations with clients um, in in, what format? Oh, in Teams. Cool. So you know, if we're sitting in our conference room, we're we're recording it so that we can look back and make sure we didn't make mistakes and hold everybody accountable. But um, AI will be able to look at that and, uh, like I said earlier, what was the decision we made on the tile in the master bathroom? It'll have access to all those conversation transcripts and and be able to tell you that. Um, we're, I'm already using tools like ChatGPT to create budgets for me, feeding it multiple spreadsheets, having it average per square foot, and give me hypothetical budgets line by line. And it does a, it takes some training, but it it does a pretty good job. Wow, that's yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's kind of cool. With an off the shelf free product, right? Right. Um, is it just imagine in a year as as, as specific tools are developed with those technologies? It's uh, it's going to be pretty pretty game changing. How do you, I mean, you have at least four companies that I uh, know about that you've been talking about previously. Uh, I mean, I could ask you how many other companies you have that you haven't talked about, but wh what company would you like to start? I mean, do you have an interest in, in, in doing something like this again? And if what space, it doesn't even have to be technology, it could be kind of anything. But I mean, what is, what's next? I mean, you clearly like building teams. I mean, we have the nonprofit, you have, you know, built, you know, software, you have, you know, a uh, building company, a remodeling company. Um, you enjoy the process, I would imagine. Yeah, um, what is my father was an amazing entrepreneur, and uh, it would it would take a whole show to talk about all the businesses that he you know, owned and operated over the years. And so, I think I, I got that bug from him. I'm I'm uh, I'm, I'm nowhere near as uh, prolific as what he he was able to accomplish in his short life. Um, but you know, I think uh, 
tech, there's a huge opportunity in technology right now. Um, it's it's a scary landscape because things are going to change very very quickly. Um, but uh, what we'll be able to do with with small teams and some of these emerging AI technologies, I think, is is uh, it's going to be very much like uh, how the internet changed so many industries, but uh, to a power of a hundred. Um, it's it, I, I think everybody's job will be different uh, in the matter of the uh, next couple of years. And so, um, looking at opportunities. Uh, to apply that technology really in any industry uh, is what's got me excited right now. Interesting. And how does your how does your team react to it? I mean, those around you, um, <laughs> he's got a smile on his eyes. If you're not watching, tune into YouTube and at 50, 56 minutes in, you're going to see a twinkle in his eye. Uh, yeah, I, I think if, uh, if, if any of my employees hear me say something like, let me show you something, uh, they, they're like, I, I don't have time because um, I get so excited about this stuff. Um, they're, they're, uh, I, they see the power of it. Uh, I think they get excited about it, um, but they've got jobs to do and, uh, and they, they're doing things in traditional fashions. But um, I think they're probably as, as excited as I am on some of these things, um, but, uh, but busy. Um, so yeah, okay. that, you know, I, I, I'm very passionate about it. If you give me a second to talk about AI and, and what I saw on Twitter last night, um, It'll be a long conversation. Well, we'll have to talk about that off script. I don't know anything about it. How um, or X, right? X, yeah. <laughs> How? Um, I guess one last question here is we kind of wrap up between your first episode and this episode. You know, uh, I meant to ask it previously as you're a fourth generational, you know, builder or entrepreneur, um, and your kids are getting older and asking this question even for myself and hearing your response because you have to deal with it before I do. Uh, do your kids seem to have any sort of interest? It's too early to tell. You had expressed that early on you were, you knew you were pretty interested. Uh, where do you think the kind of the family legacy is? And do you feel any pressure to continue? Uh, how are you and your wife going to handle kind of that, you know, as you kind of fade out of your career over the last, you know, however long you plan on building, um, uh, have you thought about what that looks like from a generational standpoint? Um, yeah, yeah, boy, I, I think probably any parent uh, entrepreneur hopes their children have an interest in what they do. I think uh, what we do uh, is is such a blessing. It's such a wonderful business, um, even with all its challenges and and uh, and complexities. Um, building is uh, is just it, it's the, the creative outlet and the financial opportunity. It's it's a great business. Um, so I, I hope my children are interested. Um, you know, like my parents, I'm not going to push them. Uh, if they decide it's something they want to do, then fantastic. I'd love for them to to get involved. Um, I'm I'm very pro entrepreneurship. I I hope that uh, that they choose to start businesses and uh, and and be their own boss uh, rather than than you know just going and taking a job because um, I see huge benefits in that um, in in so many ways. Um, but you know, my oldest at 13. Um, We'll see. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a long way from now. It feels like um, to when she might want to be involved. Um, my youngest at eight. Uh, right. You know, that's that's a that's a ways down the road. So we'll see. Um, good news is I, I have got such a great team that uh, you know, we've got employees that are so dedicated um, that uh, you know my 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 business family is already involved and uh, and and running with it and and uh, and taking it over bit by bit. Uh, it, as much as I'll, I'll let go of the reins. So um, it's uh, we, we it, it's already kind of transitioning a little bit to just the team as they take over aspects. Well, that's great. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes. I mean, we're I think I'm I'm 43. I don't even know. How, are you same age? How old are you? Uh, I'm 50 on Friday. Are you really? I am. Oh my word! You're not looking. You're 50. Well, then that, actually, I'm going to ask this question. I thought <laughs> like you said, who wouldn't want their kids to continue the business? I don't. I don't want to still be building when I'm 65 or 70. I don't I have so many other interests yeah. you know, to do. And my kids are younger than yours, so I'll be even older. But I guess my my thought on that is, I mean, do you, you know, for the next evolution of what, you know, and maybe you don't know either, but at, at some point you're going to start thinking about it. I mean, if your kids, let's say, you know, fast forward here, 10 years, you know, 15 years, you know, you're going to be, you know, 65 and maybe you do want to stay building. I mean, you love it. I'm just kind of curious. I've kind of joked like, you know, by the time my daughter is old enough and she'd be an amazing owner, so she would be just awesome at it. It's not that. It's just like, do I want to keep on be, you know, it's a, 
it's a lot of energy and and it's a lot of effort. Not everything is as great as you know we probably showcase it in our websites and Instagram and everything else. I mean, it's it's very difficult industry, very rewarding. But that's my own kind of opinion on it. Um, how would you navigate that if she does show interest and in, you can just stay on longer? Or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if my kids show interest, that that would be a huge motivator in in staying involved. Um, I know so many builders that are uh, you know approaching their late 80s that are still building homes because they love it. Um, at this point, I don't know if I've got th that in it. Um, but if my kids are uh, are alongside me, um, then, then absolutely that would be a huge motivator. Um, I think it would be too. I think it's too far away for me to can you even think about that. I just think about, man, it's just, uh, it, it's it's not it's not easy. Um, you know, with, with 23 in particular, it was in some ways a difficult year, but I'm also really excited. It's funny how sometimes the flip side of a coin is like, it's very difficult, but you're also very optimistic about, we know what the future things. I don't know how you could be a builder and not be optimistic, frankly. <laughs> yeah, I, I, th I think you have to be. I think that's our, our DNA, right? Um, but the, there's seasons in every business. Um, and uh, I don't know what season we're in right now. Um, it feels like maybe fall. Uh, we're coming off some pretty great years. Um, yeah. And I think uh, everybody in the industry that I've talked to for years have said, oh, I, you know, I, I, I kind of would like it to slow down a little bit because it's a fire hose for the last few years. Um, I had that conversation with people eight years ago uh, and it, it hasn't slowed down. Um, and just when you think that something like COVID is really going to slow down, it doesn't, it does the opposite. So um, I, I am the worst uh, prognosticator uh, <laughs> out there. So I, we'll see what happens. Um, might not be fall. Maybe, maybe we're just, uh, maybe we're early spring. We'll, we'll see. Right. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, everything will be in the show notes and um, that's all from the Curious Builder podcast uh, for today. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thank you. Hmm. Thanks for listening to the Curious Builder podcast. If you like what you listen to, please give us a five-star rating and write us a review. It really means a lot. It's a great way for us to just understand what you like about the podcast and what we can keep doing. So like and review and please share with your friends and family. Find out more at CuriousBuilderPodcast.com.